Hi, I'm Colin B. Whitaker, a fifth year PhD candidate with the University of Michigan's Plasma Dynamics and Electric Propulsion Laboratory. And I'm here to talk about making electric micro rockets using electrosprays. What is an electrospray and how do we turn one into a rocket? Well, electrosprays use a conductive liquid as a propellant. When you feed that liquid to the tip of a needle and bias that needle to high voltage, it sprays a beam of electrically charged particles. Electrospray. It's like a liquid lightning rod. Expelling this beam then creates a force in the opposite direction, creating our rocket. What makes electrospray a good rocket? It's mostly their propellant especially what are called ionic liquids, or room temperature molten salts. Imagine the table salt you have in your kitchen, but instead of melting at 800 Celsius, it melts at room temperature. Since ionic liquids also have no vapor pressure, they don't boil off in space, and this means you can store your propellant as an unpressurized liquid. Additionally, since you don't have to ionize a gas, like in a Hall thruster or a gridded ion engine, electrosprays can be efficient at smaller power levels. Combined, this makes them ideal for small-scale spacecraft that need to share a ride on a rocket, but can't risk accidentally ruining a multi-billion dollar NASA observatory if their propellant tank blows up. The biggest challenge with electrosprays is that one needle, also called an emitter, doesn't provide very much thrust, at most about one micronewton, and often much lower. For perspective, one micronewton is about the weight of a dry fruit fly. To be able to propel those small spacecraft around in space, though, we need thrust of about one millinewton or greater, or about a thousand fruit flies. To get enough thrust, we have to combine a bunch of individual emitters together. One of the best ways people have found to do this is by cutting a bunch of cones out of a porous substrate. They look like our needles, but where the fluid flows through the entire body. This is complicated to do because it's hard to ensure that uniformity in the emitters at this scale, and we may not be able to fully represent the physics, meaning that when we go to make an array of emitters and think it should look like this, it actually ends up looking more like this. That is, there's uncertainty in how each emitter will behave. When we combine this with the fact that these systems can fail from propellant depositing on the electrodes used to extract the beam, Designing one that survives and performs well, robust to this uncertainty, is quite the challenge. That's where my research comes in. The first element to tackling this problem is in quantifying these sources of uncertainty. That is, translating unknown unknowns into known unknowns. In the past year, we've had a couple of key successes here. The first was in characterizing those manufacturing tolerances I mentioned earlier. By mapping an array of porous conical emitters with an interferometer, we were able to produce a topographical map. And by analyzing the data in this map, we can determine the geometry of nearly every emitter in the array, giving us our manufacturing tolerances. These results showed that for our array, the emitter geometry could be highly variable, with a substantial population of emitters that were essentially broken. Another key development was in characterizing our uncertainty in the physics of these emitters. To do so, we started with a model for the emitter we developed to capture how these porous sources can sometimes emit multiple beams from the same emitter. However, since we have to approximate some of the physics to make the model useful, we have to train it on experimental data by adjusting some of its parameters. Essentially, we're trying to fit a trend line. However, because our experimental data and model aren't perfect, there's uncertainty in what those parameters are. And we capture this uncertainty by applying a technique called Bayesian inference, which essentially tells us that our uncertainty in those parameters is based on how likely we would be to observe the data we did given a set of those parameters. By applying this technique to some experiments that measured the beam current from an emitter, as a function of the voltage used to power it, we were able to regress our model and, crucially, represent the variance in our predictions as a result of variance in our model parameters. With these two pieces of the puzzle in hand, 
we come to the last thing I want to talk about today. That is, how do we use these techniques to inform our design when we look to build new systems? We have both our uncertainty from manufacturing tolerances and our uncertainty in the physics represented by our model parameters. By combining the two, we can see what implications this has for the behavior of an entire array. In this case, we used our model to predict the current sprayed by each emitter in the array that we measured, with each circle representing a different emitter. The question marks represent those emitters whose geometry we weren't able to measure. Our manufacturing tolerances mean that emission is highly non-uniform across the array. Even at this high voltage, about a third of the emitters aren't even predicted to turn on, and it seems a small group of emitters is doing most of the work in the array, which we expect to be bad for its lifetime. Additionally, the variation in color of each site in this picture shows our uncertainty in the current it sources individually. As you can see, some emitters were not sure whether they source a lot of current or a little current, but some emit about the same current regardless of our uncertainty in the physics. These latter ones might be a good design to target when we try and build more arrays because they perform more consistently. With that, thanks for listening. Next time, I plan to talk to you about using these tools to help design and build some really big electrospray arrays. Stay tuned.